Jesus and his take on diligence. Taking the easy path, laying back and doing the barest minimum always comes naturally to our human flesh while giving the best to tasks in our hands will always feel like going against the grain. But as followers of Jesus, it is important for us to look at the uncomfortable topic of diligence from Christ's perspective and not by our fickle imagination. Jesus the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity and the physical representation of the Godhead, has a very definite stance to work during his earthly ministry. He had a set of values centered on the importance of doing work with the best potentials in us and it was reflected in his determination to keep going even when he was inconvenienced. Let's look at the different ways that Jesus worked while on earth. 1. Carpentry Jesus did not just operate only in the supernatural while on the earth. He also worked as a carpenter, seeing as he was also the son of Joseph the carpenter. Most likely, he was an apprentice to Joseph, learning to make and mend furniture from a young age. Moving from being an apprentice to being a well-known carpenter meant that he learnt this skill through diligent observation, multiple trials and lots of discomfort. Many times, he may have even hurt himself in the process. People recognized him as a carpenter in Mark 6 verse 3, Amplified. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are his sisters not here with us? And they were deeply offended by him, and their disapproval blinded them to the fact that he was anointed by God as the Messiah. He definitely became familiar with diligence by his investment of time, effort, and patience into the career of carpentry. 2. Ministry Ministry is usually very demanding and time-consuming. Therefore, it is a perfect place to understand the demands that diligence places on us. It is in this place of ministry that Jesus spent months on end, teaching, listening, and caring. It involves a lot of investment of time, energy, resources, prayers, fasting, word study, patience, and counseling sessions. This ultimately takes its toll on anyone, but Jesus showed us that even with the work of the Master, there can't be half-measures or half-baked ideas. We have to be willing to give in our best to see great results. Ministry work is generally considered spiritual work that centers on the advancement of the Kingdom of God on the earth. But the fact that it is spiritual work doesn't make it less tedious in comparison to other kinds of works. So, regardless of the field of work that we belong to, every aspect of our being, spirit, soul, and body, must be involved. Jesus started out at quite a young age of 12. He was already listening and asking questions from teachers in the temple. Luke 2 verses 41 to 52 King James Version says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. All of these activities, even as a child, prepared him for the task that was ahead of him and shows us clearly that if we must live like Jesus, then we must live a life that embraces diligent giving our all to the task at hand. 
As Jesus became more committed to diligence, he simultaneously increased in wisdom. And wisdom will always be needed to fulfill our assignment on the earth. See what the Bible says about wisdom in Proverbs 4 verses 5 to 9 amplified. Get skillful and godly wisdom. Acquire understanding. Actively seek spiritual discernment, mature comprehension, and logical interpretation. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not turn away from her, wisdom, and she will guard and protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is, get skillful and godly wisdom. It is preeminent. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Actively seek spiritual discernment, mature comprehension, and logical interpretation. Prize wisdom and exalt her, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace. She will present you with a crown of beauty and glory. Then, by the age of 30, he went full time into God's plan and purpose for his life, which is the work of expanding the kingdom on the earth. This is captured in Luke 3 verse 23 Amplified. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son by marriage of Eli. From that time till he returned back to heaven, he never played with his ministry, moving from place to place and diligently teaching men to embrace the way of the kingdom of God. He saw himself doing exactly what God would do. John 5 verse 17 Amplified says, But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now. He has never ceased working, and I too am working. We see in John 8 verses 1 and 2 amplified how he went to the temple early in the morning to teach. This in itself is an attribute of a diligent man. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came back into the temple court, and all the people were coming to him. He sat down and began teaching them. Matthew 4 verses 23 to 25 amplified also tells us that he went throughout Galilee teaching and healing. It says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people, demonstrating and revealing that he was indeed the promised Messiah. So the news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were sick, those suffering with various diseases and pains, those under the power of demons and epileptics paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and the other side of the Jordan. He constantly had to respond to different distress calls and emergencies, yet he never gave up on his work or lived as if his ministry was an unnecessary burden. He prayed for the sick, healed them, delivering the oppressed and even raised the dead with passion, zeal, and zest that only a diligent person could offer. Matthew 9 verses 18 to 38 Amplified says, While he was saying these things to them, a ruler or synagogue official entered the house and kneeled down and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just now died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and began to accompany the ruler with his disciples. Then, a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched the tassel fringe of his outer robe, for she had been saying to herself, If I only touch his outer robe, I will be healed. But Jesus turning and seeing her said, Take courage, daughter. Your personal trust and confident faith in me has made you well. And at once the woman was completely healed. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players who were professional hired mourners and the grieving crowd making an uproar, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but is sleeping. And they laughed and jeered at him. But when the crowd had been sent outside, Jesus went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the news about this spread throughout all that district. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, screaming loudly, have mercy and compassion on us, son of David, Messiah. When he went into the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, 
Do you believe with a deep abiding trust that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, your trust and confidence in my power and my ability to heal, it will be done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout that whole district. While they were going away, a mute demon-possessed man was brought to Jesus, and the demon was driven out by Jesus. The mute man spoke, and the crowds wondered in amazement, saying, Never before has anything like this miracle been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He casts out the demons by the power of the ruler of demons. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages in Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness, his words and his works reflecting his messiahship. When he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion and pity for them, because they were dispirited and distressed, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is indeed plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. He also went to the mountain regularly to pray, so much so that even his disciples couldn't cope with his work rate. Mark 14 verses 32 to 41 Amplified says, Then they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit down here until I have prayed. He took Peter and James and John with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled, extremely anguished at the prospect of what was to come. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved and overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. After going a little farther, he fell to the ground, distressed by the weight of his spiritual burden, and began to pray that, if it were possible, in the Father's will, the hour of suffering and death for the sins of mankind might pass from him. He was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup of judgment away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. And he came back and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Were you unable to keep watch for one hour? Keep actively watching and praying so that you do not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away again and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came back and found them sleeping, because their eyes were very heavy and they did not know how to answer him. He came back a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough of that. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. 3. Jesus was also a mentor and leader to others. He continued teaching and giving the interpretation of parables to the people so as to help them understand the messages that he was trying to pass across. He diligently mentored them both by teachings and also by examples. Then he sent them out to demonstrate what they had been taught. Matthew 13 verses 10 to 36 Amplified says, Then the disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the crowds in parables? Jesus replied to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has spiritual wisdom because he is receptive to God's word, to him more will be given, and he will be richly and abundantly supplied. But whoever does not have spiritual wisdom because he has devalued God's word, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is the reason I speak to the crowds in parables, because while having the power of seeing, they do not see, and while having the power of hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand and grasp spiritual things. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will hear and keep on hearing, but never understand, and you will look and keep on looking, but never comprehend. For this nation's heart has grown hard, and with their ears they hardly hear, and they have tightly closed their eyes. Otherwise, they would see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn to me, and I would heal them spiritually. But blessed, spiritually aware, and favored by God are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, many prophets and righteous men 
who were honorable and in right standing with God, longed to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Listen then to the meaning of the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom regarding salvation and does not understand and grasp it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and at once welcomes it with joy. Yet he has no substantial root in himself, but is only temporary, and when pressure or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he stumbles and falls away, abandoning the one who is the source of salvation. And the one on whom seed was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the worries and distractions of the world and the deceitfulness, the superficial pleasures and delight of riches choke the word, and it yields no fruit. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands and grasps it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, some a hundred times as much as was sown, some sixty times as much, and some thirty. Jesus gave them another parable to consider, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds, resembling wheat, among the wheat, and went away. So when the plants sprouted and formed grain, the weeds appeared also. The servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have weeds in it? He replied to them, An enemy has done this. The servants asked him, Then do you want us to go and pull them out? But he said, No, because as you pull out the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, First gather the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. He then gave them another parable to consider, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And of all the seeds planted in the region, it is the smallest. But when it has grown, it is the largest of the garden herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air find shelter in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and worked into three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables, and he said nothing to them without using a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things unknown and unattainable that have been hidden from mankind since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain clearly to us the parable of the weeds in the field. It is obvious from different aspects of Jesus' life that he had a very strong work ethic and this is definitely what we need to emulate. Let us pray. My Father and King, thank you for opening my eyes to the benefits of living a life that extols diligence just like Jesus. Jesus, thank you for the assignments in my hand and thank you for giving me the inner and physical strength to give it all my best. I shall not faint, fail, falter or fall. In Jesus' name, Amen.